Welcome everybody to the uh, Nate 2013 keynote luncheon. My name is Todd Schleckaway, and if you haven't met me throughout the conference, I just want to say it's a pleasure serving as your executive director. First and foremost, let's give our sponsor for today's keynote luncheon, Hutton Communications, a round of applause. Thank you. One of the prevailing themes throughout the week and in general in this industry right now is the amount of work all of you are doing on the ground helping the carriers build out their networks with LTE, long-term evolution technologies. Thank you for what you do. You're the men and women on the ground making this possible. And at our table, our guest speaker, Steve Largent, the president and CEO of CTIA, you know, was very appreciative of that. And so it was an enjoyable conversation. I have the pleasure of announcing Steve today. Steve Largent is currently the president and C CEO of CTIA, the Wireless Association. Mr. Largent is a former congressman and NFL Hall of Fame receiver. He served as a member of Congress representing Oklahoma, Oklahoma's first congressional district, for seven years. And during that time, his voting record reflected consistent support for lower taxes, less regulation, and strong free markets. A member of the National Football League Hall of Fame since 1995, Mr. Largent was a record-setting wide receiver for the Seattle Seahawks for 14 years. He set six career records and participated in seven Pro Bowls. In 1990, Mr. Largent was named one of the 10 outstanding young Americans by the JCs. In recognition of a lifetime achievement, he was awarded the Golden Plate Award by the American Academy of Achievement in 1989. He was recognized as NFL Man of the Year in 1988 for his commitment to community service. Athletes in Action also awarded Mr. Largent the prestigious Bart Starr Award for serving as an exemplary role model both on and off the field. Mr. Largent received his bachelor's degree from the University of Tulsa. Following his retirement from professional football, he managed his own advertising and marketing consulting firm, working with numerous Fortune 500 companies around the country. He and his wife, Terry, have four children, Kyle, Casey, Kelly, and Kramer. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm, Nate, welcome to Steve Largent. Thank you very much for that sitting ovation. <laughs> hey, it's great to be here with you this afternoon. I want to thank Todd for that uh, rousing introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I've always thought that <clears throat> a speaker, uh, introducing a speaker after lunch or dinner was uh, probably one of the tougher jobs around. Basically, you're saying now that the meal's over, uh, it's, it's all downhill from here. Uh, so I hope that's not going to be true today. Uh, I hope it won't be downhill from here. I'm going to do my best to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, in fact, I, I promise I'm going to follow the five B's of effective public speaking. Do you all know what the five B's of effective public speaking are? You might want to write these down in case you're ever asked to speak. But the five B's of effective public speaking are, be brief, brother, be brief. So I'm going to try to follow that uh, here today. Uh, actually, I learned, I learned that lesson in a very painful way. I had just run for Congress and won in the first congressional district of Oklahoma. And the very first speaking engagement that I was asked to do was to the downtown chamber of commerce in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was at the heart of my district. And so I worked really hard preparing copious notes to go speak to the downtown chamber of commerce right after I had been elected to Congress in 1994. So I'd worked really hard and I was, I was I, I, pages and pages of notes for my speech. And so I got there and I started on my speech and I started going down my pages, got about halfway through all my notes. 
And I noticed in the middle of the crowd, there was one gentleman who jumped up out of his seat and headed towards the exit. And I'm thinking, gosh, I'm a newly elected member of Congress, and this is Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I just said, sir, where are you going? I'm not even halfway through my notes. And he stopped in the middle of the crowd, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, Congressman, but I've got to go get a haircut. And I said, well, couldn't you have gotten a haircut before you came? He said, I didn't need a haircut before I came. So <clears throat> I will try to keep it brief um, this afternoon with you. It is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I have deep admiration for the work that this industry does uh, with the wireless industry. It's uh, indispensable, uh, valuable uh, to this industry, and uh, the, the, the features that you add to wireless service, there would be no wireless service without what you do. Um, there's a lot to be said for the importance of towers and coverage for the industry. Uh, one of the things that really stands out in my mind is how many of you are used to dealing with heights. Uh, that's not something that uh, most of us do, but it's what you do. Um, and it adds a very different dimension to your job, and sometimes it presents challenges, some obvious and others not so obvious. And that reminds me of a story about a group of managers who were tasked one day with finding out how tall the flagpole was outside their building. So they, it wasn't anything like you all deal with. It was just an average size flagpole, but it turns out measuring it, the thing was a lot harder than they thought. Uh, they, they had trouble with their ladder. Uh, then they kept dropping their measuring tape. There was a lot of confusion and fumbling around. It was just a real disaster trying to measure this flagpole. Then along came an engineer, an engineer, who could see the group was having trouble. So she goes over to the flagpole, she gets it pulled out of the ground, lays it down. She measures it end to end, gives the managers the distance, and walks away. Problem solved. As she got out of earshot, one of the managers started laughing and laughing, and uh, he turned to the others and said, leave it to an engineer to get it wrong. We're trying to find out how tall the flagpole is, and she goes and measures its length. Well, I'm confident that uh, you are much more astute and accustomed to dealing with the various aspects of your jobs, but I'm sure a few of them could be a little challenging for others. Uh, I'd like to start this afternoon with a little test of your memory. Now, don't start squirming. You don't have to worry. Uh, this won't be that hard. I want to ask you to remember what you were doing in 1983. 1983. Looking around the room, I can tell some of you uh, already are off the hook for answering since you probably weren't even born then. Uh, but for those of us who were, I'd like you to try and think back to that year. Let me share some of the things that happened then. The final episode of MASH was aired in 1983. President Reagan rolled out his plan for his Star Wars defense system. Cabbage Patch Dolls, remember those? They were the big Christmas hit. And the Dow Jones climbed all the way up to 1280, 1258. Microsoft Word was launched. I don't know about you, but I still have problems with paragraph spacing. Uh, Michael Jackson gave us our first look at the moonwalk, and I never got that right. Uh, so most importantly to all of us here, in October of 83, in Chicago, Illinois, they made the first commercial cell phone call, 1983. Chicago, the first commercial cell phone call. Look at how far we've come in such a relatively short period of time. We've gone from that big, bulky bag phone to the clunky brick that weighed a couple of pounds that you might remember Michael Douglas using when he played Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street. Later came the old candy bar phones, then flip phones, and now we have phones like this, the iPhone. It's pretty extraordinary. This device and many others like it on the market today are just incredible. They put more processing capability, listen to this, more processing capability in your hand than the Apollo spacecraft at just a touch or a swipe. They're making information accessible to more people than any other device in the history of civilization. More people have cell phones, listen to this, more people have cell phones around the world than have running water or electricity. That is truly 
extraordinary. Wireless technology is bringing our profound changes in our lives, bringing about pr profound changes in our lives as well. Look at our social behavior. Obviously, we're better connected to our friends and families than ever before. Because of wireless, social media, such as Facebook or Twitter, is giving us new opportunities to share the important moments of our lives with more people. That's a good thing. I'll admit that some people might take it to an extreme. Uh, sometimes when I see someone update their status to moving on to the afternoon, it does make me wonder a little bit. But there's no question mobile social media has significantly impacted how we interact. And it's not just a tool to shine a light on our lives. It becomes a powerful weapon in the, in the, to fight political oppression uh, in foreign countries. We've seen that already in the past year. It's also proven to be instrumental at other times of crisis. Relief support after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti uh, was coordinated with mobile communication. <coughs> and the charitable support made possible through wireless was record setting. According to the Pew Research Center, 14% of the charitable donations totaling more than $30 million were made with text messaging. These are just a few examples of how wireless has truly become a game changer in how we live. All of you here in the Tower community are central to this fantastic revolution. You are vital and necessary link in the incredible engineering feat that is wireless communication. You and your work are why we are able to conduct business and share information and our thoughts and lives to such an extraordinary degree. Former President Clinton actually talked about this at our spring trade show last year in New Orleans. He said, and I'm quoting here, what works in real life is creative networks of cooperation. If you think about it, the business that we're all in created more new networks of knowledge than any other single development in human history all around the world. I think that last portion of that sentence bears repeating. The business you're in created more new networks of knowledge than any other single development in human history all around the world. That is a really powerful statement, and I completely agree with the President. Those new networks he referred to are, are wide-ranging. In transportation, they can be the information gateway that's used to ultimately tell the best way to drive home, or for a dispatcher to reroute his national trucking fleet. In the area of health, they're at the core of a program such as Text, Text for Baby. That's an initiative developed by the Wireless Foundation. It sends timely text messages to expecting and new moms to help make them and their babies healthier. Networks are also how agencies such as the CDC and the World Health Organization can track ec epidemics and disease outbreaks. Doctors are using mobile to consult in surgery in real time, even if they're thousands of miles away. It's also helping chronic disease patients with cardiac problems or diabetes live longer and healthier lives through remote monitoring. Right now, I'd like to share with you one example of that. It involves a cardiac disease monitoring initiative that includes Native Americans on a Navajo reservation in northern Arizona. The project highlights the benefits of wireless technology and the invaluable role coverage plays in serving this needy and rural population. Take a look. The landscape of the Navajo Reservation in northern Arizona is both stunningly beautiful and remote. The residents have a passionate reverence for the land, which is removed from many conveniences of modern life. For Rita Yazzie, that makes caring for her father's congestive heart failure an enormous challenge. There's uh, no running water, there's no uh, electric, and uh, from here to the hospital is like uh, an hour, an hour and 45 minutes. Some 70 miles away, the Flagstaff Medical Center is bridging the gap for Rita through a pilot program called Care Beyond Walls and Wires. 
The Care Beyond Walls and Wires programs allows us to do a just-in-time care delivery of our patients, whether they live in Flagstaff within a couple blocks of the hospital, or they live in very ultra-rural areas and don't have the ability to get in. What we do is we provide them with the cellular and wireless tools that they need to monitor their condition in the home. The system is real easy, real easy to use. Every morning I take his um, vital signs, his blood pressure, his um, O2, and then his weight. It automatically transfers into the cell phone that they gave me. And then on the phone there's a small screen with a button that says, I accept. You push I accept, and then it automatically flows straight to our care coordination office onto the software program where then Kelly can monitor those patients because all the results flow into there. Good morning, Rita. Hi, Kelly. The real-time flow of data helps nurses like Kelly to keep an eye on the program's patients, no matter where they live. She can head off problems early, change prescriptions, consult with doctors, or give advice to patients and caregivers. The program's goals are to reduce emergency room visits and hospital admissions and to lower costs. If every American with a chronic disease agreed to remote monitoring, Estimates show healthcare savings would be more than $21 billion, and there's no price tag on improved quality of life. My dad, he likes it. It's really improved his health. It used to be like twice a month that he used to be in and out of the hospital. So now, since we're on that program, he hasn't been in the hospital for probably like two months, and that's what we're looking for. Wireless is the best thing ever for me and the best thing for my dad. Maybe someday he might end up riding a horse again and him enjoying himself riding in a prairie to the sunset. <laughs>
Dozens of wireless providers such as Bluegrass Cellular, Cellcom, and U.S. Cellular are building LTE out in rural and small town America. <coughs> WiMAX is another advanced technology, and we have almost 70% of those subscribers. Remember, we only have 5% of the world's wireless subscribers, uh, so you can see that the majority of consumers using the most advanced wireless technology live here in the U.S. As I mentioned, the major U.S. carriers all have impressive plans to offer advanced services to American consumers, and that's very good news for all of you. You should also be encouraged by the increasing demand for high-speed wireless broadband. According to Cisco Visual Networking Index, U.S. mobile data traffic growth is expected to increase nine times from last year to 2017, and that that figure doesn't include the traffic offloaded to Wi-Fi. Cisco says the average U.S. mobile consumer used a little more than 750 megabytes of data per month last year. It estimates this will increase to about six gigabytes of data per month by 2017. It's also believed we're going to see connection speeds increase by 600 percent, and that smartphone and tablet traffic will be increasing exponentially. That's part of the technological evolution that's only going to pick up the pace. Cisco reports that last year in the U.S., about three-quarters of our data traffic was on 3G networks, and most of the rest was on 4G. But, but in 2017, Cisco thinks those numbers will almost completely flip around. It's predicting 63% of our data traffic will be on 4G networks and just about all of the remainder on 3G. Satisfying the need for speed and the demand for new devices with immense capabilities is a top priority for the wireless industry. Obviously, it means improved coverage and the deployment of new equipment, and that underscores the importance of your jobs to America's future. At CTI, we spend a lot of time on issues that are of major importance to the tower community. We actively engage at the FCC and with other relevant federal agencies, such as FAA, FEMA, and NTIA. Our advocacy takes us to Congress, to the states, to local zoning jurisdictions all over the country. We are involved in the courts, much more than I'd prefer, I'd like to say, but we think it's essential to stand up for the industry's need to expand coverage to satisfy consumer demand. This past year, we've been active in numerous local zoning related issues. That includes facilitating co-locations, modifications, and DAS rollout. The U.S. Supreme Court heard an appeal on the FCC's tower siting shot clock, and we're hopeful the High Court will rule on that sometime this year, possibly as early as the third quarter. The migratory birds issue continues to be a challenge, as some of you may know. There has been a lot of debate in this area, and I think we're making good progress on migratory birds. But I can't help but point out a study that just came out that you might have read about already. It was conducted by researchers at the Smithsonian's Conser Conservation Biology Institute. Have you heard about this study? <clears throat> it was funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Services. The study concluded that as many as 3.7 billion birds were killed every year in the United States by cats. Shocking, huh? Cats. I didn't mean to, uh, I don't mean to be pointing any fingers uh, by bringing this study to your attention. At the same time, I'm not, I'm not about to defend cats. Uh, I think they can take care of themselves on this one. Uh, and I don't want to argue about the merits of cats, although I've kind of been a dog guy all my life. Uh, I only bring this up to show there are a lot of factors to be considered when it comes to migratory birds. And I'm just glad that cats aren't one of the ones that we deal with. <clears throat> CTI is also actively working to streamline the National Environmental Policy uh, Act procedures. Uh, we're advancing issues before the FAA, such as relaxing the agency's 200-foot rule. Uh, we've also uh, supported policy that would help expedite siting on federal lands and buildings. Some of those new procedures were passed as part of the 2012 Middle Class Tax Relief Act. As you can imagine, the series of storms uh, and natural disasters of the past several months is shining the spotlight on business continuity and network reliability. Outage reporting and backup power are just a couple of the important uh, areas that are receiving a lot of attention at the federal and state level. 
we'll be representing the industry's interests in many of these uh, and other matters in, in the venues uh, throughout the year. We'll also keep working hard in other areas that I just went over, zoning, migratory birds, the NEPA process, FAA, uh, federal lands, they're all on our radar for 2013, and we'll, we will do our best to make progress on each of those fronts, you can rest assured. We think they're all key, uh, key pieces to advancing the industry and ultimately providing exceptional service that American consumers have come to expect. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that, but that's <clears throat> what happens when you're the best. The bar is set high when you're the world's leader, which we are. It's enormously hard to achieve that status. It's even harder to stay there. It can be a struggle, but I know we're up to it. <clears throat> Our industry is ultra competitive. You either innovate and improve or you fall behind. I believe that no other country's wireless industry comes close to providing the value and benefits as, you, as the one that you're a part of here in the US. The view from the top is hard earned and spectacular. Of all the players in our wireless ecosystem, you should know that better than any other. It is our mission at CTIA to help you and the rest of this great industry to keep that top spot. Thank you for having me today, and I'm happy to, to try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I guilted you into that, didn't I? Mr. Largent, on, uh, on behalf of uh, the Nate leadership, its members, and all of the attendees uh, today, we just uh, want to uh, express our appreciation to you, uh, you for your insights that you shared with us today, and also for your leadership uh, that you provide in the wireless industry. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you much. Thank you. A couple quick announcements in closing. We're going to continue our uh, conversation with Steve Largent in the exhibit hall on the exhibit stage. Steve has agreed to do more of an informal q and I'll be asking him some questions. After that, we will be drawing for 10 autographed footballs from Steve Largent. And I've seen the footballs. He even marked the year that he was inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So it'll be a, a memento for anyone who's fortunate enough to, to draw a winning ticket. We invite you to immediately, immediately proceed to the exhibit hall and we'll continue our conversation. But thank you again and thank you to Hutton Communications for sponsoring it. Thank you. Thank you.